Hi, good morning. I'm Arabella Santiago here at the MLK Virtual Town Hall for the Hands-On Network, brought to you by the Points of Light Institute. I'm here with Bashir Jones. Bashir? Yes, yes. Good morning, good morning. Bashir Jones, Radio 1 Cleveland Talk Show host. So excited to be here, the MLK Day Virtual Town Hall meeting. So excited, and uh, I'm very excited about how the day is going to go. Great, and we have some exciting guests today, and one of them is the esteemed Congressman John Lewis, and he's here right now. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us today. We're um, talking live to many people across the country and also across the world. Let's talk about MLK Day and why is it important to be to get in the way of pe people? Why, why, why have you said that before? Well, it's very important to find a way to get in the way. Uh, when I was growing up as a very young child in rural Alabama, at the age of 15, I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on a radio. Mm -hmm. And I had seen those signs that said colored men, white men, colored women, white women. And I would ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, and they said, don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But I heard about Dr. King. I heard his voice on the radio. And he inspired me to find a way to get in the way. So I started saying, we all must get in the way and do something. But we see something that is not right, that is wrong, then we have to correct it. Mm -hmm. And as young people, as young children, when you look in America and see these unbelievable changes that have occurred, we had a children crusade yes. in, in Birmingham, in Selma. It was the children, the young people, who made a lasting contribution. Huh? Why is it important that we commemorate Martin Luther King Jr.'s life with service? It is so important because Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the people that followed him um, made a commitment uh, to a life of service. Dr. King was not a wealthy individual. Even when he received uh, the money from the Nobel Peace yes. Prize, he gave it all away. He gave it to other organizations. He was not paid a high salary. Uh, he had a life of commitment, a life of service to help others. And we all have an obligation to reach back and, and do something. It, even before Dr. King, there was a man named Horace Mann, a modern educator yes. in America, one of the founders of modern education, who said that we should be ashamed to die until we have made a contribution to humanity. And we all can, as Dr. King would say, we all can be great because we all can serve. Wow. Wow. And how, what is your advice to continue this day of service every day as part of your, each person's life? What is your advice to people out there? My uh, simple advice to all of us in America and around the world is to make a lifetime commitment or to doing something that is good, something that is decent, and do it with pride and with a sense of love. Mm -hmm. And we, we have an opportunity now uh, with what has happened in, in Haiti. Uh, we all can make contribution, we can raise money, but in our own neighborhoods, in our own communities, uh, we can uh, clean up uh, our neighborhood, pick up the trash, visit a senior citizen yes. center, uh, paint a building, visit a school. Uh, we can read to students, read to our seniors. Uh, we can help. Some way or another. Bashir, do you have any questions for the you know, I'm, I'm just so excited to be here with, a, with an icon such as yourself. Uh, I was I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, and, and our Congresswoman, Marsha Fudge, speaks so highly about the work that you're doing. And, and being a graduate from Morehouse College, I realize and know the work, that, the great thing that you've been doing here. What can the young people, uh, you, you know, Dr. King also said that injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. And how can we as young people begin to attack this injustice in a way of service? Well, you know, 50 years ago, uh, this February the 1st, the sit-in movement started yes. uh, here in the American South. Uh, Dr. King taught us the way of love, the way of peace, the way of nonviolence. We can teach children when they're very, very young, mm -hmm. when they're in, in, in primary a daycare, elementary school, high school, in college, uh, to be kind to each other. Yes. Uh, give people 
young people a word of encouragement. Um, but we, we, we're never too young to serve. We, we're never too young to, to pass on kindness. Uh, it means so much. Uh, if it hadn't been for Dr. King reaching yes. out to me, I don't know what would have happened to me. So we have to reach out to each other mm -hmm. and create this sense of community, this sense of family, what I like to call one house, because we all live in the same house. Yes, it's not just the American house, but it's the world house that we all live in. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, thank you so much, Congressman. We appreciate your time. Thank you. We're trying to build one house through technology as well and reaching out to people that may not know about these days of service and also projects. So continue the great work, and thank you so much. Yes, thank yes. You. Yes, thank, thank you. you so much, sir. Thank Truly appreciate thank it. Thank you so much. So as the Congressman says, find a way to reach out to your community yes. and inspire and encourage young children. Yes. And I know, Bashir, you do that. And that, so right now, we also have the CEO of Point of Light Institute yes, yes. and the co-founder of the Hands-On Network, Michelle Nunn. Thank you so much for bringing this all together, bringing us together here through the virtual town hall for MLK Day of Service. Michelle, let's talk about Points of Light Institute. Tell us about it. Okay. Oh, well, tell us, tell us. first of all, we are thrilled um, to be here uh, with uh, in Atlanta, which is um, obviously Martin Luther King's home, yes. and uh, and really in many ways the birth of birthplace of many of the uh, channels and streams of the of the civil rights movement. And what an honor to be with Congressman mm -hmm. Lewis. Um, I can't think of anyone who better embodies the spirit of servant leadership that Dr. King. Um, talked about, articulated, and also uh, lived his life yes. in that spirit. So Points of Light Institute is um, an organization that is inspiring, equipping, and mobilizing people to take action that changes the world. And um, Hands On Network is our volunteer arm and action uh, entity that is uh, is making that happen across the country and across the world. We have 250 affiliates like Hands on Atlanta, which is uh, hosting us here today in Atlanta. And, um, and our affiliates across the country are hosting similar kinds of events, which we're capturing through the town hall today. And um, you know, we can't think of a more important day than today in the life of our country in terms of celebrating service, um, the, un, uh, the undone work of Dr. King in terms of creating in the beloved community and so literally today we have hundreds of thousands of people that are gathering together um, that are putting their hands to work and um, and through the vir virtual town hall we're capturing that yes. and uh, capturing across the country um, how people are doing that and hopefully engaging the larger nation in a conversation so that everyone can feel a participant right. in carrying forward Dr. King's legacy. What, what is it about you know as, as you talk about your life's work you know I can't help but to see the smile across your face. What is it about this work that brings you so much joy? Well, I think that um, service really does give back more than anyone's able to give yes. through their service journey. And that's been a tried and true, you know, mm -hmm. thing that people learn throughout their lifetime is that um, it really is the path to meaning and to joy. Yes. And, uh, and so as people celebrate MLK Day today, I think that they'll find that they receive much more than they're able to give. And it's, um, and it's an extraordinary privilege for me to be a part of this and to see the, the amazing Amazing people that are at work across this country um, building Dr. King's beloved community, not just this day, but more importantly, um, throughout the entire year. Yes, well, yes. Thank you so much, Michelle, for being an inspiration to many people here. What a great way to start this Freedom Rally with all the energy. Good morning and welcome to Hands on Atlanta's 17th Annual MLK Service Summit. I'm so glad you're here today. We're, today's theme is a teachable moment. And what we're going to talk about is how to inspire and develop servant leaders. And it's so exciting to see so many young people in the audience. Thank you so much for coming out. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you some of our sponsors for the Freedom Rally. Our presenting sponsor is Delta Airlines. And if someone is here from that company, please stand up. Home Depot is our official tool sponsor and WSB TV. And now I'd like to introduce to you a few of our special guests that are here. Michelle Nunn. Michelle, would you please stand? CEO and Points of Light, Hands-On Network President, and also the first 
Executive Director for Hands On Atlanta. And I'd also like to recognize Tracy Hoover, who is also a Hands On Atlanta Executive Director. And one of the things we couldn't do all year is without the sponsorship of our national organization, the National Corporation for Service. John Turner is our executive director of the Georgia Commission and is supposed to be here today. I don't know if he's here yet, but if you are, John, please stand up. And Cheatham Delano, who is chief information officer for the Morehouse Medical School, Cheatham, and is also our board member. And with Cheatham's help, we have been able to have this wonderful facility. And I want to thank Morehouse Medical uh, School for their support. I think a lot of times folks think of Dr. King as someone who traveled the globe, won the Nobel Peace Prize, someone who talked of freedom and of justice and of the beloved community. Uh, but I was reflecting a week ago when I was going to make some comments to young people. Uh, what came to mind to these young people who were students here in the public school system that uh, first and foremost, Dr. King was a native son of this city. And if you live here in this city, if you were born here, if you've traveled here from afar to be a part of the Atlanta experience, uh, I think that is the first thing for us to remember and to celebrate before we move on to act. And that is Dr. King is a child of Atlanta, a child of this community, and certainly a homeboy. So I think that's something for us to remember. I recall several years ago when the King Center wanted to enhance uh, the tactile impact of the celebration of the life of Dr. King. And the watchwords, of course, for the commemoration had become remember, celebrate, and act. And so Hands on Atlanta came along and said, we have a way we can help create some real connection between remembering, celebrating, and acting. Let's take this day and move beyond words. Let's move beyond uh, celebrating the glorious memory of Dr. King. And let's figure out how to get every person engaged in being a part of creating the beloved community. Last week I was at a church and I was asked to speak on, on why is it important to celebrate this holiday. And I started thinking about those three words, again, remembering, celebrating, and acting. And I thought to myself, well, it's, of course it's important for us to remember. Because in memories we develop pride. And when we develop pride in those great memories of days gone, we then start to get stimulated psychologically and emotionally and spiritually. And it drives us to celebrate. It stimulates us to talk about those stories. And it's so important to talk about those stories because in talking about those stories, we remind others who may not want to remember and we teach those who may not know how important the struggle was and how indeed today we continue to struggle to bring the beloved community forth. But even beyond remembering and celebrating, we've got to inspire folks to act. And so today, as I think about the work that we all will do, the conversations that we have, I think about the words of Dr. King when he says, everyone can serve. You don't have to be uh, a theorist. Uh, you don't have to be college educated. You can indeed act. So it is with great pleasure that I welcome you here today. And I'm really excited as president of the Atlanta City Council to look forward uh, to a partnership, Michelle, with Hands on Atlanta, working, of course, with the mayor's office as we try to make Atlanta an example of a city of service. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for the opportunity to bring welcome. Thank you, Caesar. And now we're going to have a musical selection by 360. Please wel give them a warm welcome. Good morning, good morning. Uh, how's everybody doing this morning? We're grateful for the opportunity to be here today to celebrate Dr. King, a true hero. I'm grateful. 
grateful for your love, your mercy and kindness In the midst of storms you always show up and I'm reminded That you give me strength, I realize it's never me though But you my guardian angel, you're my hero I help my strength with my knees bent My heart repairs, no will intent I lost my grip, although Rescue me cause I needed you to pull me through And I, I wanna thank you, thank you, thank you for no more No pain, no pain, no more no 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 Yes, you're my hero, you're my, my hero, king. my king Yes, we all your love And you help, 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 help me, me. Help, 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 help me, me. Sudden the burden ease. I'm grateful for your love, your mercy and kindness. In the midst of storms, you always show up, and I'm reminded that you give me strength. I realize it's never me though, but you my guardian your angel. You're my hero. Yes. courageous persons the civil rights movement ever produced, Congressman John Lewis has dedicated his life to protecting human rights, securing civil liberties, and building what he calls the beloved community here in America. The Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, has called Representative John Lewis the conscience of the U.S. Congress. And Roll Call Magazine has said John Lewis is a genuine American hero, a moral leader who commands widespread respect throughout the chambers of Congress. Please help me welcome our Congressman, John Lewis.
Our next panelist, featured in the articles, or featured in articles in Atlanta Business Chronicle, Atlanta Journal Constitution, Atlanta Magazine, Business to Business, Southern Voice, as well as other publications across the Southeast. He was named one of Atlanta's, Atlanta Business Chronicle's 40 Under 40 in 2008, and one of Georgia Trends 40 Under 40 in 2009. Doug Shipman is currently serving as the Executive Director of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. Doug was most recently a principal in the Atlanta office of the Boston Consulting Group. He has been with the center since the inception of the project in 2005. Please help me welcome my friend Doug Shipman. Last and best looking. <laughs> Moderating our conversation is Emmy Award winner Jovita Moore, who anchors the 5 p.m. newscast on Channel 2 Action News. Jovita received her Bachelor of Arts degree with a major in literature from Bennington College in Bennington, Vermont. Jovita made the 2007 list of 40 under 40 by Georgia Trend Magazine and is a member of the Leadership Atlanta class of 2007, which I'm sure she would call the best class ever. It is my pleasure to welcome Jovita Moore. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. How is everybody today? I'm gonna to try to do my best Oprah imitation this morning, how about that? <laughs> While we engage you two in a conversation here, um, we have so many young people who are ready to take part in Hands-On Atlanta Day, so we appreciate you get, giving them food for thought as they go along with their day of service. Um, my first question to Congressman Lewis is talk about how has the world changed since the Civil Rights Movement? And maybe has it changed? We live in a different world. Uh, I grew up in rural Alabama, and I saw segregation and racial discrimination. Uh, I tasted the bitter fruits of racism, and I didn't like it. As a young child, when I would go downtown to the little town of Troy, about 50 miles from Montgomery, uh, I saw the signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting. When I would go to the theater with my brothers and sisters and first cousins, we all had to go upstairs to the balcony and all the little white children went downstairs to the first floor. And I would come home and ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, why segregation? Why racial discrimination? And they would say, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. Don't get in the way. Don't get in trouble. But in 1955, I was 15 years old in the 10th grade. I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on old radio and seemed like he was speaking directly to me, saying, John Lewis, you too can get in trouble. And I got in trouble. <laughs> I got in trouble. It was good trouble. It was necessary trouble. And I started serving. I got involved in the Civil Rights Movement. I met Dr. King three years later in 1958 at the age of 18. But before meeting him, I met Rosa Parks in 1957 when I was 17. We attended nonviolent workshops almost 50 years ago. It is hard to believe. Before we started sitting in, back in 1955 and 56 and 57, in 1960, black people and white people couldn't sit together at a lunch counter in downtown Atlanta, in Nashville, Tennessee, in Montgomery, Alabama. Couldn't stay in the same hotel. Couldn't ride in a taxi cab together. And because of Dr. King teaching and leadership, we changed that. Mm -hmm. We changed it. So when people say nothing has changed, I feel like saying, come and walk in my shoes. <laughs> those signs are gone, and these young people will not see those signs. The only place you will see those signs will be in a book. 
in a museum mm -hmm. or on a video. It is a different world. Just think a few short years ago, in many parts of the American South, people of color could not register to vote. And look today, we have an African American president because people are now able to register and vote all across the South and all across America. So we, we certainly have come a long way in this country. Oh, it's a different country, Jovita, it's a mm -hmm. different country. It's, uh, people were so afraid. They were afraid to be afraid. And it's, it's a different world. Okay. And in speaking of a different world, uh, now, lately, it seems like we hear a lot about human rights, that sort of the conversation has changed, I think, from civil rights to human rights. Doug, can you talk about that? What, is there a difference between the two, and what is it? Well, there is a little bit difference between the two. When you think about civil rights, you're really talking about laws the rights that we all have because we're a citizen of the United States or because we're a citizen of another country. But human rights are even bigger. Human rights go beyond the fact that you're a citizen and they really mean what are the rights you have because you're a person. How should we treat one another even if it's not legal? The right to vote is a legal right, but the right to be mean to somebody or the right to be nice to somebody or the right to be treated well, that's a human right. And so it's a much bigger picture, it's a much harder thing to actually accomplish human rights. It's interesting, if you go back and listen to Dr. King at the very beginning of the movement in Montgomery in 1955, he talks about a human rights movement. He doesn't talk about a civil rights movement. His sights were set on the ultimate goal, which is that all of us treat one another with respect and with equality. And that's not something you can put into a law. That's something you have to live every day. That's something that you have to actually do to other people at the grocery store, on a service project, at school. And so human rights is even a bigger standard. Civil rights is how we actually put it into law. And so human rights, I think, is what we should be striving for. Is there an example that you can? You can clap for human rights, it's all right. <laughs> is there an example, Doug, that you can share with the, the young people who, who are here today of some human rights issue that's happening right now in our world or in this country? Sure, I mean, there are lots of human rights issues that are happening today, but one that's actually around young people is the right to actually go to school. Now, we take for granted the right to go to school. In fact, many young people in this room would say, I, have a, I don't have a right not to go to school, right? I actually have to go to school. But in many parts of the world, kids don't have the right to go to school because they are already employed, or even worse, they're actually in some sort of enslavement. They're actually not even free to do anything. And so when you think about young people today, the right to go to school, the right to an education is a human right that in many places kids don't have the right to do. And so that is something that is being worked on from a human rights perspective, from a United Nations perspective, from a U.S. perspective, and it's happening uh, in many places. Congressman Lewis, you mentioned, of course, our first African-American president, Barack Obama. And a lot of people will say, well, now we've made it. We've realized Dr. King's dream. We've reached the mountaintop as a country. But then a lot of people think that we have not. Is there a next frontier that you see in civil rights, in the civil rights movement? Is there another barrier or hurdle that we need to get over? Well, I agree with Doug so much so. We got to move far beyond uh, civil rights. Uh, I consider health care as a human right. That it's not a privilege, but everybody, every, every, every human being, not just every citizen of America, but every human being that live on this little planet, that live on this little spaceship that we call Earth, has a right to decent health care. And Doug, you will agree that the lack of food, the lack of shelter, People should be able to, as Dr. King would say, get education for their mind, get food for their stomach. And we have a right to live in an environment where there's clean air. We have a right to know what is in the food we eat, what, what is in the water we drink, what is in the air we breathe. Those are, that's human rights. And young people can speak out. You can organize. You can 
write letters, you can petition. Look, during the 60s, we didn't have a website. We never heard of internet. Uh, we didn't have a cell telephone. We didn't have a fax machine. But we used what we had, and that's what young people must do today. Dr. King said we all can be great because we all can serve. You look at the Birmingham movement that Dr. King led. You look at the Selma movement. It was the children, the young people led the way, and many of us followed. Doug is leading up the effort to um, bring the Civil and Human Rights Museum to downtown Atlanta. Um, and the plans are underway to bring that here. Um, of course, this being the cradle of the civil rights movement, we feel that Atlanta is very appropriate to have that museum here. How is that museum going to sort of bridge civil rights and human rights and make it a conversation that everyone can understand and, and take part in when they come visit the museum? Yeah. In an institution, there are a couple of things you can do if you think about the museums you've been to. One is you can start at the beginning of the story and learn it from past to present. And basically you learn it because you should learn it. The other is you can actually start with things you care about today and then you can figure out how history can help you work on the things that you care about. And so the way that we're going to link it is actually by starting with the issues that we face today, both nationally and internationally, human rights issues, issues of water, issues of health care, issues that affect us, and then say, let's look at Dr. King and see what words he has that still matter. Let's look at the civil rights movement and see how young people played a role. Let's look at Atlanta and see how Atlanta was special. You know, there's this phrase, Atlanta was too busy to hate. How many of you guys have heard that phrase? <laughs> well, Atlanta wasn't too busy to hate. There was plenty of hate. But Atlanta was refusing to explode. Atlanta wanted to make progress happen. And so every time that there was something that needed to be done, Jewish folks and Christian folks, white folks and black folks, business folks, religious leaders, politicians, all came together and said, how do we solve this problem? That was what made Atlanta special. Unlike some of the other places that wanted to fight, Birmingham and Selma, the places that Congressman Lewis was on the front lines for, this was the place that actually wanted to make a little bit of progress each time. That's an inspirational story that each of us can tap into. And so the center is going to bring those stories, but it's going to bring them forward so that each of us can take a little piece and apply it to what we're working on today and can be inspired just a little bit more to go out and, and to do something. And Doug, let me ask you this question since we are celebrating King Day. What was it about the work of Dr. King that inspired you or has inspired you in your life to do what you're doing now and to lead you where you are? Well, I, I didn't have the privilege of growing up in a small town in Alabama. I had a privilege of growing up in a small town in Arkansas, which I don't know is better or worse, but it's probably pretty similar. Um, and growing up in that small town, I ended up coming to Atlanta to college. And when I first started reading Dr. King's words and hearing his words, I had exactly the same act reaction that Congressman Lewis said. I said, he is talking to me. This is someone who actually is saying the things that I am thinking about. He is addressing the issues that I care about. And so actually Robert Franklin, who's now the president of Morehouse, was teaching a course at the time. And I became so excited that I had found somebody who understood my frustrations and who was inspiring me to go and do something. And so the words of Dr. King and moreover, and to some extent, the hard work of Dr. King. I don't know how many of you saw the King Papers when they were up a couple of years ago, but one of the most interesting things to me about King Papers, Dr. King kept note cards throughout his life. And on each note card was an idea or a quote or a reference, and he would use those note cards to make his speeches and sermons. He'd lay them out like an outline, and he'd say, I'm going to use this quote to start, and I'm going to use this reference, and then I'm going to quote this book, and then I'm going to use this scripture, and that's how I'm going to do this. And what it reminded me of is that Dr. King had to work really hard to sound that good. And that inspired me, because if he didn't have to work hard, then there's no hope for me. <laughs> but he had to work hard. He had to work at it to think about what he wanted to say, to sound so interesting and to sound so inspirational. And so that's an inspiration to me that if I work hard, that I can make an impact too. And I think that can be an inspiration to all of us is that it wasn't just because he was a prophet, but it was also because he rolled up his sleeves and, and worked at it every day. And that continues to inspire me. Very good. And Congressman Lewis has probably seen those note cards 
uh, firsthand. You might have even been there when he was writing a speech and, and preparing to talk. Is there a particular experience with Dr. King that still stands out in your mind or a particular conversation? I know you have so many, but is there one or two that you could share with us? Well, the man was such a, such a believer. He really did believe. He believed in the goodness of America. He believed in the goodness of humankind. And Doug is right. He worked hard. He, um, he planned. He just didn't wake up one day and say, we're going to march from Selma to Montgomery, or we're going to march from Washington, or we're going to organize the Freedom Ride. He planned. He studied. He prepared. He conducted nonviolent workshops and taught us the way of love, the way of peace, the way of nonviolence. And he, but he also was a man of with a great sense of humor. And uh, he, can, he would make you laugh until you would cry. Mm -hmm. uh, he would joke with us from time to time. But he was a very warm and compassionate human being. I remember as I had been hurt on the march from Selma to Montgomery, after I had been beaten and hit in the head by a state trooper with a club. One day we were walking and it was just raining. The heavens opened up, just started raining. And Dr. King had his cap on his head. I didn't have a cap oh, at the time. He took this cap off of his head and said, John, you need to wear this cap. You need to protect your head. You've been hurt. I would never forget that. I would never forget that as long as I live. Uh, he was always thoughtful, considered. Uh, when I moved to Atlanta in 1963, after finishing school in Nashville to become head of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, he received the Nobel Peace Prize. He didn't keep that money. He gave some of that money to our own organization and to other organizations. He was always giving and sharing and working very, very hard. Doug is right. He was a committed, dedicated leader. He was a servant leader. And he looked out and cared for all of us. Aside from Barack Obama, is there anyone that you're looking to as sort of the next generation of leadership in this country, someone that the torch is being passed to? Well, all over America, uh, you have many, many young people. Look at the young president of the city council. Uh, we have, a young, we have a, a young mayor here, but you have many young people. Uh, they're black, they're white, they're Latinos, they're Asian American, they're Native American. Uh, I went out to Seattle on uh, Thursday and to speak for the King holiday. And then I was in Florida on Friday. And I think Dr. King would be so proud and so pleased to see all these young people coming together. For they're forgetting about race and color, and they're laying down the burden of race. Uh, the diversity that I see in government, in, in, in business, in education, it's amazing to me the distance we've come. So I'm very hopeful, very optimistic. And I think the election of Barack Obama has inspired a generation of young people and the same way that Dr. King inspired many of us just to pick up. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what I like about uh, Hands on Atlanta service. You know, a lot of young people just give it themselves they don't get paid very well. Right. It's volunteer work, really. Right. Uh, when, during the height of the movement in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, I think we were paid something like $10 a week. And when it took out the taxes, I think it came to nine forty. dollars some cases nine sixty. <laughs> and if you happen to be married, I think you got $20 a week. But uh, it was for expenses. But we were committed to serve. 
And just as you said, Mr. Lewis, you first heard Dr. King's words at the age of 15. Perhaps there's someone in this audience now listening to you and Doug who will be the next John Lewis or the next Barack Obama or even the next Caesar Mitchell or Doug Shipman to, uh, to lead this city and to also lead this nation. We have about a minute left, so I'm gonna ask Doug, um, what is the one thing that you'd say to the young people here about how their role, um, th the part that they can play in, in moving our country forward? Well, each of you is, is doing something very special today, and that is that you are, in my opinion, exercising the highest form of leadership, which is to serve. The service that you do impacts those that you're serving, and it impacts you because it gives you a sense for that feeling of service. But I think the one thing that I would tell you is never forget how inspirational your service is to Congressman Lewis, or to Councilman Mitchell, or to Michelle Nunn, or to Gina Simpson, or to me. We get excited to see you here. I will go and I will tell others how many people were in this room, how many young people were in this room willing to serve today. I bet if you ask Jovita the stories she's worked on that are the most memorable, they're almost always the stories of people who are serving others selflessly. So never forget that your service helps you, it helps those you're serving, but it helps all of us to continue to have hope and to continue to work hard for, for the beloved community. So I just want to say thank you for helping be inspirational. Thank you so much. Believe it or not, that's our time for this conversation. We're gonna keep the program going this morning. Doug Shipman, Congressman John Lewis, thank you so much. Can we give them another round of applause? tell you how excited I was when I found out that over 50% of our last year AmeriCorps members wanted to come back this year. And these are the selected few that were selected from last year's team. And I want to thank them especially as president of Hands on Atlanta. I work with them closely. I speak to them. I talk to them. And it's a great group of folks. And I'm so proud of them. And you guys, in by standing in the first year, you've got the second year to look forward to. We hope to see you again next year, too. Let's give them one more round of applause. And now we're going to begin the Presidential Service Awards. And I'm going to ask the AmeriCorps members to exit to your right and left. We're, as we begin to give the Presidential Service Awards, these are, this is really what service is about. It's recognizing our volunteers and those that have been servant leaders in our community the whole year through. And at this time, Walter Jackson and Paulette Payne are going to come up and give these awards. Good morning, everyone. I hope you have enjoyed this phenomenal program thus far. Um, as Gina mentioned, Walter and I will present to you awards to a group of individuals who have made it their business to live out Dr. King's dream through servant leadership. America has a long tradition of volunteer service, as we all know. Now, more than ever, Volunteers are renewing their commitment to helping others and making new connections that bring us closer together as families, as neighbors, as communities, and as a nation. The President's Council on Service and Civic Participation was established to recognize the valuable contributions volunteers are making in our communities and encourage more people to serve. Recognizing and honoring volunteers sets the standard for service, encourages a sustained commitment to civic participation, and inspires others to make service a central part of their lives. It is my honor and my privilege, along with Mr. Jackson, to recognize some outstanding individuals who selflessly give of their time, their talents, and their resources to Hands on Atlanta. If you are present, Please come forward to receive your award, which is signed by our president, Mr. Barack Obama. Our first category are gold award recipients, 
and these volunteers have filled more than 500 service hours. Again, more than 500 service hours. Our first recipient is Ms. Brenda Rhodes. Brenda joined Hands on Atlanta on October 27, 2001. To date, she has contributed more than 805 hours to Hands on Atlanta and our community partners. Ms. Brenda Rhodes, give her a round of applause. <laughs> Dr. James Winfrey. This California native has spent countless hours speaking to children not only in Atlanta public schools in the state of Georgia, but throughout the United States. The recipient of compassionate mentorship himself as a child, Dr. Winfrey is now a mentor and finds joy encouraging and motivating young people. Dr. Winfrey. <laughs> Lloyd Foster. Lloyd works with our springboard program and serves more than seven of our partner agencies. At Hands on Atlanta, Lloyd has worked with the Citizen Action AmeriCorps team and has assisted with volunteer orientations. Mr. Lloyd Foster. The second group of honorees will receive the Silver Award, and they comprise 17 members of our Teamwork Steering Committee. Of course, this is a group of dedicated former Teamworks participants who decided they wanted to help the program in a greater capacity. Steering Committee members are responsible for developing program policies, goals, and planning and operating other program activities. And these are our two recipients for this year, 2009. Next, we have the Bronze Award, and this award is given to adults who have filled 100 to 249 service hours. Our first recipient is Deborah Cross. <laughs> Deborah works with our Springboard program and serves on the Springboard Steering Committee as well as a volunteer consultant to nonprofit board directors engaged in strategic plan development. Thank you, Ms. Cross. Regina Dobson. <laughs> Regina joined Hands on Atlanta in 2003. Some of the projects she has organized, developed, and led include Wadsworth Magnet for High Achievers and Stone Mountain Elementary. <laughs> Regina Dobson. <laughs> Ms. Sarah Ridgway. Sarah has been with Hands on Atlanta since 2005. During this time, she has developed and led projects at Hamilton E. Holmes Elementary School, Gilbert House, and Love T. Nolan Elementary School. <laughs> Thomas Warner. <laughs> Thomas became a volunteer through the Springboard Program he enjoys helping other nonprofit organizations develop strategic plans that can carry them to the next level of success. He is currently assisting the board of directors at Gilgal Incorporated, and from what we hear, he's doing an outstanding job. <laughs> Thomas Warner. All right, finally, we will honor a young adult who has filled between 100 and 174 service hours, and he is Jim Chimalacuzzi. <laughs> Jim joined Hands on Atlanta in 2005, and since that time, he has volunteered with Books for Africa, Boys Who Dare, Chastain Memorial Park, among other agencies. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just witnessed what Dr. King's dream of the beloved community means. It means servant leadership, and this, these are shining examples of what that entails. So please give, along with me, a round of applause for some outstanding servant leaders.